Hello and welcome to the Daily Digestion Channel. In this video, we're going to read the first three parts of the Niacin the Real Story by Abram Hoffer, MD, PhD, Andrew W. Saw, PhD, and Harold D. Foster, PhD. Um, this was written by a man who had worked alongside with another uh, doctor who had uh, experienced a lot of uh, profound experiments with the niacin. Uh, this is a really great book. It's very informational. If you're curious about niacin and you really want to know the truth about niacin and the history of it, uh, I absolutely love this book. So, uh, actually, what I'm going to be doing is, uh, of course, reviewing this book and letting you know that you probably definitely should read it, uh, especially if you're having uh, arthritis problems, children's learning and behavioral disorders, mental illness, cardiovascular disease, and other conditions. Um, it says here it gives you ac accurate information on niacin side effects and safety, how to take niacin with detailed recommendations on forms and therapeutic doses, dosages. And guys, this book does exactly that. It's written in a way to where you can find everything really easy. You don't have to read the whole book to get all of the information out of it. And uh, we're going to start out, um, I'm going to read the, um, the foreword, the preface, and the introduction, which is why you should read this book. And the reason I'm going to read these first three things is because um, if you go on Kindle, you can get this information for free as a sample, as a Kindle sample. So if you want to do that, you can, but I'm just going to read this just in, for informational purposes. So uh, to go along with some of my uh, information on the ATP cofactors, um, and I'll put links down in the description box for that video and the iodine protocol, because niacin is one of the ATP cofactors along with riboflavin. So, uh, niacin is uh, also known as a B vitamin. So, um, guys, it's completely natural and safe. It's in, so, it's in small amounts in foods, and it, we're depleted of it, it within our diet. So, um, you might want to look into taking some niacin and doing a little research on it. Uh, my mother actually took niacin when I was younger. I remember mother taking uh, the niacin for the niacin flushes because she was healing her body of uh, breast cancer. And uh, she actually was successful on healing her body. Well, this is a therapy along with orthomolecular medicine that you can use as well. But let's go ahead and get into the book and I won't bore you with all of my information. Okay guys, we're going to start with the foreword. Um, niacin raises good cholesterol, HDL, more than any known pharmaceutical, while simultaneously lowering total cholesterol, triglycerides, and the most pathogenic form of, cho of cholesterol associated lipoprotein VLDL. This wide array of generally clinically desirable chemical adjustments is undeniable based on precise biochemical measures. Niacin extended release formula, Niospan, has been shown to reduce disease progression in four other clinical trials as well. Good medical doctors will prescribe niacin for reducing cardiovascular disease risk and provide a description of how to use it. Niacin is frequently the gold standard control used for basic research experiments using animal models of arthrosclerosis. 
In clinical trials, when niacin has been compared to other marketed drugs, it has led to most undesirable effects for business, but most therapeutical beneficial effects for the fortunate patients. Cardio cardiovascular disease, CVD, kills more individuals than any other disease. Accordingly, there is tremendous drive in the pharmaceutical industry to make drugs. Merck and Schering Plow convinced doctors to spend $21 billion over seven years selling Zetia, e -Z -Timba. Ultimately, however, clinical trials would thereafter reveal that Zetia actually increases cardiovascular events, making mean arterial walls thicker. Thus, it is no longer a good business idea for the pharmaceutical industry to compare drugs to niacin head-to-head. -head. Immediate release, IR, niacin works just as well as prescription extended release, niacin. But it costs approximately $15 a day to obtain 3 grams, while IR niacin costs a just about 50 cents. ER, ni ER niacin causes less of a flush response initially, but with regular usage, IR niacin results in little to no flush at all, while all of the benefits are still reaped. While the benefits of niacin for treating CVD are undeniable, given the rigorously precise biochemical measures. There have been more controversy over the benefits of niacin for treating schizophrenia and behavioral disorders. 60 years ago, Dr. Abram Hoffer entered this scene at the all-time height of psychiatric equivocation. When he first proposed with Dr. Humphrey Osmond to try much higher doses of vitamin B3, which is niacin, for treating what resembled the dementia seen just a decade prior in the pellagra epidemics of the 1940s. Sigmund Freudian based psychotherapy was all the rage at this time in the early 1950s. Refrigerator moms emotionally unresponsive mothers were given as the causal explanation for schizophrenia. Abram and Osmond results were stunningly effective in the cure rate for schizophrenia. Even more so than today's best med medicine used for treating schizophrenia. Nonetheless, poorly understood drugs are repeatedly marketed to suffering schizophrenics. While an increasing variety of other newly defined mental and behavioral disorders are defined, this book, Niacin, The Real Story, relates niacin to description of the three main psychotic disorders. Bipolar disorder, characterized by dramatic mood swings, schizophrenia, characterized by per perceptual hallucinations and delusions, and schizoaffective disorders characterized by periods of both of these. As illustrated above with Zetia example, it has gotten so rare that anyone addresses the most important question anymore. What works best? It is such a simple question. Instead, too much research today proceeds primarily from a for-profit motive. It is also so rare to have someone who, has, who was around to witness the historical transformi transformation of medical motives from a health and improved, improvement motive to a much increased profit motive. As Abram Hoffer and Harold Foster did, 
The prophet machine ultimately consumed the spirit or focus of many, a well-intentioned doctor, but Abram insisted and persisted in weathering the storm, risking his stature among his peers to maintain the premise of his work, always addressing the question, what works best? With an open mind and an incredible work ethic, ethic, Abram continued following the most recent research right up until the end. There is so much more to the story of niacin than its success in treating CVD. Firstly, there are other distinct molecular versions of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD, precursor besides niacin that are also, dis also covered in this book you hold in your hands. Secondly, there are so many observations that would remain hidden from modern medical education if it were not for the work of the author of this book, Dr. Andrew Saul. Abram Hoffer's experiences treating patients with high doses of niacin or niacinamide were almost too numerous to tell. Even today, niacin function, functioning as a precursor to NAD perennially excites and stimulates modern discovery in molecular biology and pharmacology research. One of the most amazing mice used by scientists for 20 plus years has been the slow Wallerian degeneration, WLD's mouse. Wallerian degeneration is the process of neuronal degeneration that occurs after physical insult to the neuron via razor incision or crush, crushing of axons all in a petri dish. Normal neurons completely degenerate within 24 hours of damage. However, the Wald's mouse resists degeneration. Amazingly, Wald's neurons survive for over two weeks, all without a nucleus, while still being able to be exited for at least a week. Eventually, the gene was mapped and determined to involve triplication of the NAD synthesizing enzyme encoded NMNAT1. Nicotinamide mide minonucleotide adenylin transferase 1. While NAD itself could in part substitute for the neuroprotective activity conferred by this fortunate genetic mutation. Further, research realized a role for the NAD-dependent pathways frequently involved histone deacetylase enzyme CERT1 in Waldlerian degeneration, multiple, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and others in our best animal models available for studying human disease. This name, CERT1 enzyme, was previously identified as being critical to conferring caloric restriction, CR. Dependent increases in lifespan where CR is the only proven approach shown to consistently extend lifespan in all animal models. However, with the genomes sequenced at the end of the shining day of the molecular biology revolution, the most important question remains, what works best? To this day, it would appear that niacin ranks among the highest in this regard, based on sheer historical observation.
Pellegro was the most devastating nutritional deficiency epidemic ever reported in the United States of America. This epidemic deficiency was in large part the result of modern developments in food refining. When technological advancements enabled mass milling and the production and introduction of white rice and white flour to large populations of people, the pellagra epidemics followed, and then the golden age of vitamin discovery began. We realize from this history that modern human beings are simply most susceptible to niacin and vitamin B1 berry deficiencies. Thus, it simply makes sense that we would most likely benefit from a higher dose application of niacin during stress or disease situations, which are well known to actively deplete NAD. Once niacin is transferred to NAD inside the cell, it is used in more biochemical reactions than any other vitamin derived cofactor over 450. This surely factors into the molecular basis for its very varied physiological activities. Does it not therefore come as little surprise that niacin works to provide relief for so many conditions? Unfortunately, as Abram Hoffer once said, niacin works so good that nobody believes it. Reality is what we always want to believe, but sometimes it's hard to believe. The fact is, there truly are so many situations where increased NAD is what we need to allow our bodies endogenous chemistry to catch up to the insults inflicted on it. Whether it is too much consumption of sugar or alcohol, too much stress, too much fat, and ad infantinum. In basic scientific research there are many experiments that obviously can never be performed on human beings. We have to learn the tragic way. This involves simple observational analysis with the most medically significant lessons arising in urgent response to wars rather than through the standard biomedical scientific method. Abram and Harold lived through such wars and worked with the victims and reported with Andrew Saul on many of these most important examples of treatment with high dose niacin. Their lessons are veritable timeless treasures. Aside from their research Reports of high-dose niacin treatment do not exist in the standard medical education literature. In this book, you will finally observe first-hand examples of the results of clinical niacin use that has never been told before. It is an invaluable resource for everyone interested in maintaining optimal health. And guys, this um, foreword was written by W. Todd Penberthy, Ph.D., Research Professor, uh, University of Central Florida, Department of Molecular Biology and Microbiology. Okay, now we are going to read the preface, or the preface. Many people have no idea how many illnesses are caused by too little niacin. And practically no one realizes just how many illnesses can be cured with mega doses of niacin. It is the author's intent to change that. Our objective is to provide a reader-friendly 
problem solving book. This book is not nearly so much about the niacin molecule as it is about what can be done with a lot of niacin molecules. Therefore, this book concentrates on niacin's clinical benefits in a number of health conditions. These conditions successfully treated by pioneering niacin research Abraham Hoffer MD PhD are based on his more than 50 years of medical practice. Dr. Hoffer, whose capacity for work continually astounded me, began this book at the age of 91. Unfortunately, he died before it was completed. Medical geographer and professor Harry Foster, our co-author and longtime collaborator, also suffered untimely death during the earth early stages of writing this book. So if you wonder why this book is not thicker and more comprehensive, there you have your main reasons. This is most certainly not a textbook. However, standing on the shoulders of these two giants of nutritional science, I have endeavored to add to and complete the existing manuscript without altering Abrams and Harry's voices. Harry, the medical theorist and scholar, and Abram, the experienced and courageous physician and researcher. You often will find Dr. Hoffer's voice in this book in first person, with the initials AH followed in parentheses. The other voice is mine, AWS, that of the teacher, recontour, and parent. I am honored beyond measure to have worked for years with Dr. Hoffer and Dr. Foster. I think Abram Hoffer and Harry Foster were and will ever be regarded as two of the great medical innovators of the modern era. Dr. Hoffer was the world authority on niacin. This constitutes his final work, of which he said simply, this book is designed primarily for clinicians and the public who want to learn more and more about niacin and its wonderful properties. I hope this handbook may prove to be a significant part of his legacy and a real help to all readers. Andrew W. Saul, November 2011. Now we're going to read the introduction, why you should read this book. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is yoga, yogi bera. That's a little quote at the beginning of this uh, little introduction uh, that was written by yogi bera. In the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn says that advances in science do not occur in an evolutionary or straight line manner. Instead, such steps take place in a series of violent revolutions separate, separated by long periods of relative peace. During dramatic uprisings, one conceptual worldview replaces another. These intellectual revolts are not random events. They are promoted by the discovery of significant anomalies, emergent facts that the ruling dominant theory and its supporters fail to adequately explain. These exceptions to the rule are the termites of the scientific theory. As they multiply, they become more and more difficult to ignore. The newly infected ruling theory weakens until it eventually collapses. A paradigm shift occurs as another takes place. 
While the drug-based pharmaceutical industry continues to control conventional medicine, its support structure is increasingly, increasingly termite-riddled. Weaknesses are being illustrated by new highly critical books with titles such as Deadly Medicine, Overdosed America, and Death by Modern Medicine. Of course, the drug-based approach to health will not be abandoned any time soon unless society has a viable alternative waiting, like an understudy in the wings. There it must be quietly attracting its own more open-minded supporters. The author of this book are members of one such group, Advocates of Orthomolecular Nutrition-Based Medicine. They support an approach to human wellness that involves the use, not of drugs, but of substances that naturally occur in the human body. Niacin is one of these, and as such seems destined to eventually play a significant role in the upcoming inevitable medical paradigm shift. It is impossible here to show all the advantages society will gain by switching to nutrition-based medicine. However, this initial chapter provides a variety of examples drawn from several specific categories of wellness. The remainder of this book seeks to examine in much more detail the case that can be made for the far more widespread use of one such nutrient, niacin, for the prevention and treatment of health issues. By eating diets that are deficient in essential nutrients, Many individuals trigger their own chronic degenerative diseases later in life. It has been known for millennium that the basis for health is good nutrition. Orthomolecular medicine, a description coined in 1968 by Linus Pauling, goes further. Pauling describes a medical modality that uses nutrients and normal, that is ortho, constituents of the body in specific optimum quantities as the dominant treatment. Such health nutritional relationships have been comprehensively explored most recently by Hoffer and Saul in Orthomolecular Medicine for Everyone, Megavitamin therape Therapeutics for Families and Physicians. It has been further recognized that individuals are unique in their daily requirements for vitamins, minerals, and protein. For each nutrient, at least 2.5% will need higher levels than the rest of the population. There are about three dozen nutrients. Doing the math, it becomes apparent that most people are deficient in something, even if they are consuming the USRDA, United States Recommended Dietary Allowance, nutrient levels every day. We are all different, and you are a bit different every day. Illness, medications, age, variations in diet, fatigue, and stress are among the many factors that today can make you different from the you of yesterday. It has been seen that you are what you eat. This very orthomolecular concept is true, but in a deeper way, you are what you absorb. To illustrate, as Hoffer and Saul point out, in regard to nutrients, there may be a problem with absorption in the intestines. Thus, with pernicious anemia, specific areas in the gut that normally absorb vitamin B12 are lacking. 
or after the vitamin is absorbed, it may not be combined effectively into its coenzyme, or it may be wasted or held too tenaciously by some organ system, thus depriving other parts of the body. Orthomolecular means the right or the correct molecule. This, the name was coined by Linus Pauling in 1968. Conventional pharmaceuticals tend to be toxi-molecular. Vitamins and insulin are examples of orthomolecular therapeutic substances. Chemotherapy would be ex an example of toxi-molecular therapy. We need all the nutrients all the time in the same way that an aircraft needs all of its wheels and wings. Roger Williams has described a basic concept called the orchestra principle. Just as it is impossible to claim that one instrument in an orchestra is more important than another, so to maintain health, all the nutrients required by the body must be available to ensure well-being. Though impossible to outline the enormous number of illnesses that can develop as a result of nutritional imbalance, we can illustrate the principle. It seems likely that calcium and selenium deficiencies promote many cancers. Excess aluminum and inadequate magnesium and calcium are linked to Alzheimer's disease and a lack of sulfur is associated with osteoarthritis. Certainly, there are many other well-known nutrition illness connections as well. As will be seen from the remainder of this book, niacin plays an especially significant role in orthomolecular medicine. Inevitably, its use will increase as the medical paradigm, paradigm shift occurs. Orthomolecular treatments are typically far less expensive than drug-based conventional protocols. Embracing orthomolecular treatments will make prevention and treatment available to the poor. If this statement might seem overly ambitious, we might consider this. A single orange may cost one dollar. It would provide about 50 milligrams of vitamin C. A bottle of 100 tablets of vitamin C, 500 milligrams each cost about five dollars. In terms of vitamin content, the orange gives you orange gives you 50 milligrams per dollar. The supplement gives you 10,000 milligrams per dollar. There are, of course, other nutritional factors and advantages to eating oranges, such as sugars, taste, bioflavonoids, and fiber. However, one cannot easily deny, at least in terms of vitamin C, that the supplement is 300 times cheaper, costs costing about half a cent for the amount of vitamin C in a $1 orange. Even if your oranges could cost only one-tenth as much, an impossible 10 cents each, the supplement is still 20 times cheaper. The same is true for niacin. Niacin supplements cost approximately $5 for 100 tablets of 250 milligrams each. That works out to be almost about 5,000 milligram niacin per dollar. Healthy foods naturally containing significant amounts of niacin cost far more. Once again, the many nutritional advantages of eating kidneys, liver, 
whole grain bread, nuts, and green leafy vegetables are considerable and undeniable. In terms of niacin content, however, there is no competition. Several dollars worth of these foods provides only tens of milligrams of niacin. Niacin fortified foods such as breakfast cereals, white bread, and pasta are slightly cheaper. Niacin sources, but not so much. Interestingly, the fact that milled grains have any niacin at all is due to niacin, niacin being added to them in the manufacturing process. Adding niacin to foods is a form of low-dose supplementation. The US RDA, which is far too low, is less than 18 milligrams, yet bodily need for niacin varies with activity, body size, and illness. About half of all Americans will not get even the RDA amount of niacin from their diets. Niacin's special importance is indicated in that the U.S. RDA for niacin, which again we say is very low, which is a very low figure, is actually 20 or more times higher than the RDA for other B vitamins. 20 teaspoons will not clean up after a hurricane much faster than one will. We think that a lack of sufficient niacin is a real and continuing public health problem. Okay guys, this concludes the um, reading of the preface and well the forward, the preface and the introduction of why should you read this book. Um, guys, this book is amazing. I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, links down below uh, to where you can look this up on Amazon and you can order the book used or you can I, I would recommend that you buy the newest uh, latest version try to get the latest version also you can probably get it on Kindle uh, to where you can probably even get it on Kindle to where you can get it read to you if you want to do that um, or you can just get the book there's nothing like having a book in your hands to where you can underline and write things down and remember things. I love like actual books and just to always have a physical copy of the book on your bookshelf. There's nothing quite like that experience. So I hope that you will educate yourself on the niacin and uh, check into it. Try it out for yourself. Start. Remember, start out with low dosages. And, um, you know, you do definitely want to go with the, um, the flushing type from what I have researched that is the best type to get. Um, but, of course, if you cannot do that, you might want to look into it uh, and try it out. Always start low. Uh, don't take your niacin on a really hot day where you're going to be out jogging or sweating. Uh, you know, that's not a good idea. And uh, don't, it, don't take your niacin right before you go to bed because you'll probably wake up in a couple of hours with a niacin flush. So, that being said, I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, niacin is one of the ATP cofactors for the iodine protocol. If you have not checked out my iodine uh, protocol series uh, library list, I'll leave that link down below in the description box along with the um, links to where you can get this book. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I definitely need subscribers. And also, leave down in the commentary below if you your experiences with niacin, what you think about niacin. And uh, after you go get it, please come back, let us know what it does for you. And I hope you enjoyed this video. 
And if you have any questions, also leave those down below, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Bye!